Free question basically carries correlation a little further. Correlation determines the strength of an association versus regression is predicting a dependent variable. So, well, we get to that in a second. So, okay, so you have a dependent variable and we will have today an example of um, depression at depression score, and you will find the respective paper describing this depression score uh, in your canvas. That's the so-called back depression inventory. That's one of, uh, of the most often used tools to actually quantify depression in, in a clinical setting. And basically what we are trying to do now is to develop a regression model that allows for us to uh, predict depression based on the number of traumatic events an individual had during their lifetime. It's an interesting example essentially because models like this are really used in, in, in clinical practice. So how is this being done? And now this is why I wanted to recap and, and go back to the correlation coefficient because essentially you can now, so let's take a step back. You remember standardization, calculation of a set score. The set score is calculated as the individual score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That gives you the actual set. So it gives you the distance of an individual point from its mean expressed as the number of standard deviation. So it contains the information of the mean, the information of the variability as the standard deviation and the information of the individual point. Because you are having now a uh, a correlational component and, and uh, you have a depiction of the correlational strength and the numerical value of the correlational strength and a numerical expression of the direction of this association with the correlation coefficient, you can now predict a, so a predicted y, a predicted dependent variable by basically establishing an association between a standardized x, a standardized independent variable, and the correlation coefficient. What does this mean? When you remember last time when we talked about correlation, we had an Excel spreadsheet and we meant to predict uh, the example we had last time, not this one. So we had uh, here the number of absences of a student and the following exam grade. So if we depict now absences, exam grade and absences, uh, we're gonna, no. we basically can now build, a, we can build this catapult fairly easy, which we have all done already. We can now add um, a trend line. And now in addition to this trend line, we can now display, and we have talked about this briefly last time, and you have this calculation, the calculation how you calculate this trend line on your spreadsheet. So you basically you have here, this is a predictive function. This is a linear function allowing for you to predict each individual dependent variable entry, or each individual score as a function of the number of absences. So if you have somebody, well, uh, yes. So if you have somebody who, who missed four classes, you can use this linear function to predict his or her exam grade. But it didn't happen yet. Well, yes, exactly. But you don't actually have that as a data point. Exactly. So you're extrapolating, if you remember that. So essentially you have a certain predictive strength, which is the R squared, which is the amount of variability explained by, uh, by, the, by the function, by the model, which is the R squared, that's the proportional reduction of error by the model. And you have a slope, which is the slope of this function, which is basically the decrease over one unit of, of, of uh, uh, independent variable. 
and you have an intercept and the intercept is per definition where x equals zero so this is where it crosses that axis and this is what we're going to do today so this is regression and this is the prediction of regression regression and this each time you do it numerically you're trying to predict uh, and this by basically uh, taking into account, into account standardized scores, you basically you're going a step backwards and you're utilizing the information of the correlation coefficient to actually uh, you utilize the relationship between the direction and the actual angle of this association with your um, with your numerator and the information of the variability in the denominator. So you're basically you can now calculate a standardized y that's your predicted y hat classically uh, you will always see a predicted value is uh, indicated as a y hat so you see this little hat on top of the y that indicates it's a predicted value so this predicted uh, set score of an individual y is basically uh, here predicted by uh, a standardized x multiplied by the correlation coefficient. And this is how you get this predicted set score of any predicted y that associates to that particular standardized x. So this is a relationship that basically is arithmetically related and interrelated. And you can basically, based on that, you get uh, an, an, a so-called least square estimate of your function. So you're basically building your function that way. So this is an example of such, an, uh, of such a function, of such a prediction. So we have here an, an, R, uh, an, an correlation coefficient of 0 0.58. And you are basically predicting here standardized scores. So you have here, a standardized x scores where zero indicates the mean. Minus one is one standard deviation to the left of the mean. Minus two is two standard deviation to the left. One is plus one, two is plus two. Multiplying this with 0 0.58, which is the correlation coefficient in that example, basically gets you the minus 0 0.58. So the correlation coefficient basically gives you a bit of information already how much with one set score, with one standard deviation, your uh, actual uh, dependent variable will change, your standardized dependent variable. So this relationship is super important to keep in mind because it, it remains stable. It's a linear function, right? The only thing you need to do now is to uh, go back with your predicted y, your standardized y, to the actual y. And that gives you the actual relation. And this is what we're going to do today. It, it sounds harder than it is. It's in principle super simple, but you need to kind of once have intellectually comprehended it, and then it's going to stick. It's, it's one of the most fabulous and one most intuitive uh, methods, essentially, and it's brilliant. So what does it mean that correlation? Well, in the same fashion as we did in the last time, and we will do it in an example today. Uh, so it's basically it's the, the sum of all products between uh, the deviations divided by the sum of squares under the square root. Okay, so this relationship essentially uh, gravitates around the mean. So basically, it will go through this standardized mean. So now, uh, consequently, you have a phenomenon, and this is important, and many questions on the quiz will basically point towards this. You have a phenomenon that is the regression to the mean. The regression to the mean is a little bit tricky, but it basically means that the regression will always gravitate towards the mean of your uh, independent variable. So this is problematic when you use it actually for predictive purposes because outlier essentially are then being taken into account and are basically are skewing the direction and it may not actually predict the actual uh, slope of the association. Um, 
So the bin were over the formula that the transition can be used. Okay. So the problem becomes now when you use this for prediction, it becomes problematic. And I'm just going to another slide a little further back. Uh, because the regression to the mean here, essentially, this is a scenario where it becomes problematic because if you're fitting a regression function through previous values of, uh, of stock market values, you essentially you will gravitate out the mean. That means that outliers will essentially overall in a time score prediction gravitate towards back to the mean. And this is basically what the regression to the mean implies. Outliers are essentially always meant in future predictions to gravitate back towards the mean. If you have a solid time frame of observation before that. But enough about that. This this is just more of a concept. So whenever you see, whenever you see a, a prediction function that basically is skewed by outliers, it will always go back towards the mean. So they will always point towards the mean because arithmetically it needs to point towards the mean. And this is the phenomenon of regression to the mean. So. Any questions to regression of the mean, the calculation? Because then we can actually start to uh, look into the calculation. So we have now uh, an example. Stressful life events and the relationship to depression. We have data of 10 individuals and you have the spreadsheet uh, on your canvas in the module. And we can now quickly start with the calculation right away. Because the first part of this calculation we know already. So we know already that uh, the correlation coefficient is super easy to calculate. So we have now our stress for life events. So we have 10 individuals, we have an average of 1.9 life events. So this is the average. Now we have a standard deviation. The standard deviation can easily be calculated by stdef.p, uh, stdef, actually no p. And this gives us 1.66. We have equally, we have uh, an entry on the back depression inventory of 15.7 with a standard deviation of 9.35. So now the first thing we want to calculate is, well, let's, let's first, let's do the following. Let's first uh, do a quick uh, scatterplot that we actually can look at whether this scatterplot and this regression analysis actually makes sense. So we have here, if you look at these scatters and these points, you kind of see some loose association, right? So based on that, you could actually, uh, okay, let's just read that. So we go on the chart element, we have axis titles vertically. This is now our dependent variable. So this is now back depression score. And then we have here, we have the number of stressful life events. Does it count? So we see some loose association basically pointing towards a positive correlation. That means that there's an increase in the depression score with an increase of the stress for life events. So now we want to see whether there is an association. So first we need to calculate the actual numerator. So when we look at our correlation coefficient, we have first the numerator and the denominator. 
the numer numerator is the sum of all uh, products between the deviations. So this is basically uh, so this would be uh, equals and this minus uh, this. multiplied by this. This minus this, right? So this is basically the same calculation as we done last time. And that in the greater scheme of things just gets you our product of the deviations. So it's basically, it's, it's uh, the product of the deviations from the x-axis and the product of the deviations from the y-axis. Uh, completing this formula all the way down and summing it up gets us the numerator, which is 18.7 here. The next, the only thing we need to do next is the square root of the product of the sum of squares. The sum of squares essentially can easily be calculated as, uh, okay, we should have actually, yeah, this it is. Okay, so we have a sum of square of uh, SSX and SSY. This is basically X minus the average. So that's our squared deviations. And now we have the same with the y. y minus our mean. Uh, carrying this all down and summing it up basically gets us our sum of squares. So now the correlation coefficient is now easily calculated as this divided by the square root of this multiplied by this. Right? Gets us an R of 0 0.58, which is the 0 0.58 that we had in the previous example. So, uh, no, and and, and uh, the depiction of calculating standardized um, scores. So, now we have this correlation coefficient. So now let's recap this formula. We know we know that uh, our predicted y can be predicted. No, where is it now? Yeah. Our, our our standardized y hat. Our predicted standardized y can be predicted by multiplying our standardized X with our standardized Y um, with our correlation coefficient. So we basically, we have here six entries. So if we just take three out of these and we say, okay, so X is now three, two, and one. So our X here are the stressful life events. And we want to predict our y, which is the depression score. So we know that our uh, mean stress for life event is 1.9. So our set x is basically calculated as this minus the mean, this minus the mean, divided by our standard deviation, which gets us here set X of 0 0.66. Make sense so far? I know it's a little bit, a lot of calculations, but uh, it's not. So if you do here zero, so we can just easily pull this down all the way. And we get here exactly what we would expect. 
So we get here our standardized X. So basically when we know that our mean is at around 1.9. So these individual X entries give us here up to two, gives us positive set scores for X. And as soon as it's lower than the mean, it basically becomes negative, right? It's standardization as we have done it. So now calculating uh, a set Y, set Y hat is basically easily done by uh, multiplying this individual set with the correlation coefficient. This gets us now a set Y hat. So these are the predicted y hat values. So these are basically the y's that you would expect for uh, your dependent variable with these changes in your standardized x. So now this being said, logically, how will you get to the actual y, to the predicted y? It's by just reversing the standardization, which is simple, right? We know how to do that. Y hat is basically <clears throat> this set multiplied by our standard division of Y plus our mean. And this will get us to a predicted Y. So it's the L20 multiplied by C14 for our uh, standard deviation plus a mean. This gets us to a predicted Y hat and to further predicted values. So now what does that mean? You remember when we talked about the regression function and you can see this essentially in the, in the following for uh, so this is of the calculation uh, laid out. So we have now this line of best fit. This is basically this line that we have in our scatter plot. And what we want to do now, we want to uh, develop the regression function, this function for this line. And we discussed last time that this, and this is somewhere in here. And we have, uh, you know, so a regression function, uh, a function of a line is basically determined by a y equals a slope multiplied by an x plus an intercept. And this comes back to what I showed you before. So the slope is the increase of the dependent variable with each increase on your independent variable X. That means that if it increases from one to two, the increase will basically be characterized by the slope. Bless you. So if you want to know the slope now, you can actually easily calculate that because we have calculated our prediction here already. So we have here increases from zero, one to two to three. So each of these incremental increases is essentially our slope. So if you want to quantify here the slope, this slope can be calculated as the increase of Y, uh, of, of, of y hat at two stressful life events minus the y hat at one st stressful life event. So this is our slope. You can easily do this by uh, calculating the difference between y hat at three stressful life events minus the y hat at two stressful life events comes to the same thing, right? Because it's a linear function. So it's a linear slope over increases in X. And now the million dollar question is, if you have an intercept and you want to determine an intercept and the intercept is where a function basically crosses this X axis, 
uh, the, this y-axis where x equals zero. How would you possibly get the value where x equals zero? And you don't even need to calculate anything because the answer is already in this table. So you just want to know the y value at where the x equals zero. When you look at this table, do you think this information could be there? You're looking for the predicted y where the x equals zero at zero stressful life events. We have four different predictions here. We have four predictions for our dependent variable. The 9.54. Exactly. The 9.54 is our intercept, correct. And that's the beauty of it. You have pretty much everything uh, pretty simply displayed. In Excel, you can also, you can obviously, and we have done that last time, you can do this, do this even faster. Uh, Right. Basically, you go in chart design, you do a chart element. So Excel is doing it for you, right? So you can now just, if you click on uh, add display, display equation on the chart and display R squared on the chart, you basically have exactly that formula. And you have exactly that regression function displayed. But this is how you derive it. So you're basically, you're predicting standardized scores of y by utilizing the correlation coefficient to, uh, for each uh, to calculate, uh, multiply, uh, multiply each uh, corresponding standardized x. And this gets you to slope and intercept. Good. So now you want to know next, how good is my function? How good is my model to actually predict this information? And you will do this by calculating the so-called proportional, um, um, proportional reduction of error. Because the reason for that is your function may not even be that good because you can fit a function through every possible uh, scale. But the problem is you have errors in your predictions. And this error is essentially uh, determining whether you think you have a good function or your function is not that good. You usually get this uh, logically by calculating how far are these individual points away from, from my function. So if I fit the line through this, how far are all the points away? And this distance is called the so-called residual error. That's the residual error from your function, from the predicted value. And so now we want to calculate this, this residual error. So if we were to calculate now a y hat for each of our uh, individuals, so we have, again, we have our function is now y equals 3.24 multiplied by a stressful life event plus 9.542. So this is exactly how we're going to calculate it because you can predict it for each individual in your data set. So if you do a y hat, you basically uh, calculate stressful life event for individual one multiplied by 3.24. And let's, let's make it a little bit more accurate by taking the actual uh, value. There's a little bit more decimals plus our intercept, which is 9.542. So this gives us a predicted y hat. So individual one had one stressful life event. So he is one of these three individuals here. So either this one, this one, or this one. We know that uh, 
his prediction is 12. And we know his actual value, uh, if you looked, it's actually 10, or somewhere around 10. So it's this person here. So each individual point you can now predict based on your function. And the distance, the difference between that, and this is the residual error, is this minus the actual quantified, oh no, there was actually the other person. Um, so it's this prediction minus your actual observation. So with 24, it was this individual actually. Sorry, I misspoke. So this is number one. This is individual one. In Excel, when you, once you hover over it, you essentially you get um, point 0.1. So it's one and 24. So it basically gives you the actual values. So if we want to lock this in now, uh, this is stressful life event. We don't, we're locking only these P's in. You basically can do this for every individual now. So this gives you now an actual residual error. Notably, this residual error, if you're summing this residual error up, and this is important because it's called a least square method. So you basically are minimizing the deviations and this is how you have fitted this function through. The sum of these residual errors needs to be zero. Arithmetically needs to be zero. So now next you want to have these deviations and you do now a residual error squared. This is now the residual error squared. Gets you all of these now in the positive. And you're again squaring them and you're summing them. This is basically a bit like calculating, uh, calculating a standard deviation, right? So you're basically, you're calculating a residual of your, from your functions, the actual point, uh, and, and you subtract the prediction. By that, you get the deviation you're squaring the deviation. And by summing this up, you actually, you get again, a sum of squares. And this is the sum of square of your regression. And so now if you want to know now the, uh, the leftover error after employing your prediction. So this is what you have explained. So the leftover error is now the total variance. So that's, that's the variability, that's the sum of squares of your y minus the sum of squares of your predicted regression. So this is now F13 minus the SS regression, which is 526 gets you a sum of square residual error. And I'm wrong, I misspoke. That's the residual error. That's the leftover error. That's the residual error. And that's the sum of square of your regression model. So these 261 are essentially what you have explained with your regression. And this is a, a depiction that Nolan and Heinz make. So this is why this is important because a, a, a function that basically has a scatter like this is less accurate in its prediction as compared to this. That's why you need to quantify how far are my points away and how well does my uh, function essentially explain that scatter. So this is why we need this proportional reduction error. Uh, so you will find syn uh, synonyms to this uh, proportional reduction error. So also remember it's the effect size in an ANOVA. Don't forget that, that it already appeared there. But most likely we'll hear it as coefficient of determination or just plainly and shortly as R squared. 
the R squared is calculated as uh, your sum of square total minus the sum of squared error. So that's the leftover, the, the 261 that we calculated, divided by the sum of square total. Because this is what has been reduced. That's the error that was reduced from your scatter. So this is the calculation of this total sum of squares minus re your residual error after calculating the individual error of each individual prediction using your function. So this leftover error, if you want to calculate this now for your coefficient of determination is now the 261 divided by the 788.1. So it's the fraction of explained variability of the total variability from the sum of squares of the y. I know that step is a little bit tricky to follow. I'm, I'm well aware, but just keep in mind, you basically, you have a total variability quantified as the sum of squares of the y. This is your depression score. You have an actual function developed now using this uh, standardized scores. And what you're doing now is you're basically employing this function to calculate the predicted y. As a consequence, you get a deviation from uh, each individual y from your predicted y. You're squaring this and summing this up, you get a an, an residual error, which is the variability of each individual data point from your prediction function. You're squaring this and you're subtracting it from your total sum of squares, from your total variability. The leftover is your reduction in error, because this is what you're explaining now with your function. And um, calculating uh, this uh, sum of squares regression as a fraction of your sum of squares of y gets you to an R square of 0 0.33, which is consistent with the R square that Excel provides you. Any questions? I know it's a little tough. It's not a simple one, but it's think 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 about it stepwise through. We're coming from a correlation coefficient that gives you a direction in relationship to your variability. You're utilizing this correlation coefficient to calculate from standardized X scores that give you the deviation of each individual point from the mean X. Now you're calculating for each of these individual standardized axes, you're calculating a, a standardized Y, you're utilizing the mean of Y that you know to calculate your predicted Y, you utilize this to develop a function. And then you employ the function to calculate for each of your data entries, a predicted Y. You use this predicted Y to calculate the difference from the actual observed Y, Thereby you get a residual error. You square this, you sum it up, you get a residual error. That's the sum of squares of your leftover residual error. You're subtracting this from the total variability you see in Y. So you basically, you, you, you have this total variability of Y, you're subtracting the leftover variability after employing that function and predicting it using the function. The leftover is this is what your function has basically done to reduce that error and that scatter and has been able to predict that scatter. And the fraction of that, this is your proportional reduction in error or coefficient of determination, which is a marker of, this, of the predictive accuracy of your regression function. Of note, we had a uh, a correlation coefficient calculated as uh, 0.576. In a univariate analysis where you only have two variables, you can basically calculate the coefficient of determination as uh, the square of the correlation coefficient. But do not do that once you have more than one variable because on Wednesday, uh, on Wednesday, we will discuss um, before we start with R, 
we will discuss multivariable re uh, regression. Because the beauty of regression is that you can increase your predictive accuracy by including additional variables in your model. So you can basically, because stress for life events is not the only predictor of, of depression, right? So there's, there's just more that could be happening. And you can add additional variables to predict more of your variation in your dependent variable Y. And we will do that on Wednesday. Um, good. Any questions so far? It looks trickier than it is. Um, if you go through it step by step by step, it will become very clear. Let's quickly, uh, let's quickly see what I have forgotten. Um, okay. So we have done all this. So you have the stepwise approach you have here in, in the slides. So we have basically, we have determined a set score for X. We've calculated that. Uh, we have developed the line. We have developed that for our example. We have determined the best line of fit. Predictions are full of errors and the margin of errors factored in the regression analysis. The variability can be measured. Also of note, in some situations, you may wanna know uh, some kind of local variability. So you can calculate basically a standard error of the prediction of each individual X value. So you basically, this variability is not constant. So this changes actually with the number of data points at each corresponding X. So the standard error of the estimate is the typical distance between the regression line and the actual data points. So this is this standard error. The proportion and reduction of error we discussed. Uh, and this is a visualization of the error. And we will see a graph uh, on Wednesday that basically allows you to very much uh, depict this uh, error. So there are various methods, and these are so-called diagnostic plots that you basically use to uh, diagnose your regression model. Um, yeah. So when you think about residual errors, you basically see exactly this variability and this variation from the predicted line of, uh, of the regression function. And now this is also where the regression of the mean again becomes important in this context because extreme scores, irrespective of how extreme they are, they will skew your, uh, your regression function because of their extreme nature and they will skew the mean. But overall, uh, extreme scores will always tend to gravitate towards the mean in a time series analysis. Limitations with regression, data being analyzed, they're usually not from a true experiment, randomization. It's usually, yes, it's usually more used in, in its simplest form, it's more used in cross-sectional analysis and not in uh, prospective analysis. Randomization can be true. So these are randomly sampled, but they're not randomized in each respective group. So it's a, it's a different analytic approach. The independent variable is usually a scale variable. I'm not sure whether it should be a limitation, but that's up to them. Limitations in predictions like those found in correlations applies. So the, these limitations are essentially that you have uh, predictive accuracy that is only as good. You will never be able to predict outliers with, uh, with certainty, particularly not if you have uh, a univariate model like we have done. And so there are the limitations basically. Regression to the mean, stop, uh, stock incomes, so if, if you have outliers in one line uh, in, in, in one year, as here in this uh, table of uh, stock values, whatever that is, um, you basically you have here outliers and very high values in one year that are basically then in the following time period gravitates towards the mean of this overall uh, time period. So that's a regression to the mean. Uh, example in the context of investing and this is uh, true for all models that you will be building moving forward okay 
And then on Wednesday, we're going to start talking about multiple regression. Yeah. So multiple regression essentially allows you to include more than two parameters into your prediction equation and thereby increase your prediction accuracy moving forward. But we will do this in more detail. Because just as said, it's like it's it's not only stress for life events that determine uh, back depression score. There's more that basically will lead to that. And here, sleep deprivation is essentially uh, one of the additional factors they want us to pay attention to. Okay, but more about that on Wednesday. And I guess we can conclude for today. Thank you. If it's about the quiz, so we'll go through every question. No, 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 no. Oh. I thought this technique worked, so I did it, but I wanted to say that I like I didn't do a whole word document. I just looked at the answers over here. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. As as soon as I can see them easily uh, in a bird's eye view, and I don't have to scroll through it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.